Thank you for that very kind introduction. And thank you to CIFAR and, uh, and Global Health for inviting me here. It's uh, been a long time coming. We started planning this over a year ago. And like everything else, um, this, this other pandemic came, came in the way. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here today. And um, I have kind of felt like a pioneer today as we've been navigating all the challenges, logistical challenges of uh, making these meetings happen. So thank you also to, to Chris and other people who have, and Danielle who have been so helpful. Couldn't have um, had such a successful day without you. And also very patient with all of my questions and multiple iterations of slides that I sent to you. So. <laughs> um, anyway, so without further ado, um, I think you all know I'm here to talk about the role of stigma in global health, and I on purpose didn't title it just in, in HIV, because I think it's a cross-cutting theme, uh, not just across um, continents, but, uh, but also across diseases and, and personal conditions and characteristics, and I'm not going to have time to talk about all of all of our research today. I'm trying to stay stay focused so we can um, have somewhat of a discussion as well, and I can give you more of an in depth look at um, at some of some of our programs. So I'm going to keep it to uh, primarily to HIV stigma, but also talk about some preliminary research um, or results that we just had um, uh, that we just analyzed from a study of mental health. Um, so those, those will be the two threads today. Um, and um, this, this is really the bottom line. Um, you know, as, as fellow human beings, we want to reduce the stigma because we don't want people to suffer. But it is also good public health. Um, stigma leads to both... Uh, adverse mental health consequences and, and uh, physical health. Um, it makes, it leads to depression, anxiety, psychological distress in general. It makes people not want to talk about their condition when it's stigmatized, which of course means it's much harder for them to get the help they need. Uh, they often don't come in to treatment settings if they think that they're gonna be discriminated against. Um, they may miss appointments, they may not show up to pick up uh, their prescriptions or go to the pharmacy for refills, and even when they have their pills, uh, they are less likely to adhere. So it's in all of our interest for so many reasons uh, to understand and reduce stigma. And... Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just HIV, even though that's where most of the recent uh, stigma research has focused. Um, if you um, look at the literature and, and search for terms like physical disability, cancer, epilepsy, um, mental illness, you will, um, you will also find a large number of studies uh, with very similar uh, drivers and consequences, surprisingly so. Um, so this is kind of close to my heart, uh, and this is not necessarily based on our results, but based on my experience. Um, yes, most stigma has some universal drivers and universal consequences, but you cannot just take as many of us do, especially in the West, our models and wander into another country and assume that the same drivers and the same consequences will apply there or that the same uh, questionnaires and scales will work in their settings. Um, you need to take the time and, and uh, work with, with the local affected community and actually let them take the lead and tell you um, how you need to ask these questions and uh, make sure that um, you are using the right terminology and that you are aware of, of the context and the structures and, and other um, factors that, that impact uh, what it is you're looking at. Um, 
crucial that you find out what the particular drivers are in your context. Otherwise, how are you going to target them in your interventions? Um, I see this third point in a lot of the grants that I review and a lot of the papers that I read. People say, we measured stigma, or we're going to measure stigma. And they don't tell us what dimension. And stigma is not unidimensional. Um, asking people what they think the perceived norms are around stigma in their community is very different from asking them what are your internalized uh, norms? What do, you, what do you believe? What of this have you internalized? Asking people about stigma experiences they've had or being discriminated against is different from having watched what happens to someone else or what we it's been called multiple things. We have kind of settled on the term vicarious stigma, no, not to Albert Bandura, and, um, and also anticipated stigma, because think um, your perception of norms may affect your behavior even if nothing has happened to you yet, because you are anticipating it. So anticipated stigma also often referred to as stigma fears. So make clear what it is that you are studying, not just stigma. And then um, this is another kind of pet peeve of mine is that we can't burden just the individuals who are, who are targeted by the stigma, who are the stigma victims, if you want, because it's really too much responsibility to expect them to both be the targets of this stigma and discrimination and also be the ones who overcome it and do something about it. Interventions really need to focus largely on those who are doing the stigmatizing. Try, I know it's much more challenging of a research project, but try to find out who it is that's doing this and do what you can to make them stop. It, not saying it's wrong to be helping people who are affected by the stigma to cope with it, but it's really not fair to place the entire burden on that. So I'm getting off my soapbox. Um, about that now. And we're not really going to delve into intersectional stigma today, but I felt that no talk these days about stigma is complete unless you at least acknowledge it. Um, because many, many of the populations that we all study are living with at least two stigmatized uh, characteristics. I was just on a Zoom call recently with an NGO that uh, some people here are about to work with where they're working with uh, LGBT, uh, undocumented uh, Latino populations. And if you just think about those three characteristics, um, all very stigmatized and, and could prevent them from disclosing who they are and, and what they need or seeking care or even learning about care. And then if you want to talk of that also, uh, that some of them are going to be HIV positive, that's the fourth one. And it's, it's easy to say this for me here now, intersectional stigma is important, but there really is no consensus um, out in the community about how do you measure it or how do you measure its impact. But there are a lot of really smart people out there who are working on it. So um, Seth Kalichman has done a lot of work on it, Janet Turan at, at UAB as well. So I would encourage anybody interested in it to go and look up their work. They thought about it way more than I have. Um, okay, so what, I was, what I'm going to do today is, as I said, focus primarily on the last 18 years, which is hard for me even to believe that it's been, of working on HIV stigma in India. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, present some um, brand new kind of hot off the presses, uh, where it's actually not in press, um, just hot, hot off the, the data analysis printer, um, uh, work on internalized mental illness stigma that was kind of a side piece of a uh, larger trial that we did on um, the uh, identifying and diagnosing and treating um, common mental illnesses in, in people showing up in primary care clinics, also in India. So I will um, I will start off with with that piece uh, before we delve into the HIV 
So, as I mentioned, we had a uh, just a randomized trial of, and I know I don't have to describe what a collaborative care intervention is because I'm at UW. Um, but we had this intervention in 50 rural primary health clinics in, in, Karnata, in the state of Karnataka in South India. Um, the uh, study was designed to improve uh, screening, diagnosis, and treatment of depression and general anxiety disorder in patients who were presenting with either symptoms of diabetes, hypertension, or high cholesterol, or heart disease in general. Um, we had components that were clinic-based and components that were community-based using the medical officers who were basically general practitioners in the clinic uh, with support from psychiatrists at, at our university, St. John's. Um, and the nurses and pharmacists working in these clinics, as well as lay outreach workers, named, they're called ASHAs in India, accredited social health activists, um, uh, who, um, who worked on various components to, uh, to diagnose and, and treat men mental illness uh, in their communities. And then we also, because I'm really interested in, in the role of stigma in all health, we um, added um, a scale on internalized um, stigma of mental illness uh, that is made. And just wanted to present so you, since I said that it's important to look at dimensions, these are the dimensions measured uh, by the ISME. It, they, it looks at an alienation subscale. And uh, this is an example of a question I feel out of place in the world because I have emotional problems. And I should mention that in the original scale, it says mental illness. That doesn't work in India. You just scare people off if you say that. And we found, and the psychiatrists we worked with said, um, just say emotional problems. They will understand that's what it is. Um, and we did. And people answered the question as if we had said mental illness. So that's another example of don't just walk right in there and think you can use your scale developed somewhere else. Um, and the, and uh, the second subscale stereotype endorsement. Um, so that's when they buy into the social stereotypes, discrimination experiences, exactly what it sounds like, and social withdrawal. Um, uh, and there's a lot of um, shame and embarrassment in, involved there. And then there's a fifth subscale that just did not work for us. It didn't hang together. It didn't correlate with anything else. And that was one that was uh, positively worded. And people just didn't know what to do with that one. So for this analysis, we took that out. And for us, the combined scale is just on the first four um, subscales. So as you can see here, um, this is how the various subscales and the total is being correlated uh, with some of the psychosocial factors that we look at, highly correlated with depression, with anxiety, negatively with social support, um, negatively with, with quality of life, um, and positively with disability. And it was really the alienation that, that had the strongest association, even though in, for most of those, even though they were, I think they were all um, statistically significant. So I'll just give you a moment to that. And I, this is being recorded. You will have access to this later if you feel like I'm hurrying through it. And uh, I should mention that um, this is a very large sample. We got almost 50 people from each of these 50 PHCs. So the total sample is 2,475. There will be some variables later where it's slightly less because um, the people may have, uh, have responded not applicable to some questions. But that's the, the total sample. Um, then we thought we wanted to look at um, if the association between um, internalized mental illness stigma and suicidal ideation and were um, 
saddened and um, surprised, or maybe not surprised, but we hadn't seen this before. So I guess in some, some way we were surprised to see that uh, the total ISMI score is significantly associated with um, having a, reporting at least moderate suicidality. And I have the definition on that at the bottom there. It's based on the endorsement of question nine on the PHQ-9 scale. Uh, and then they were given the mini suicidal ideation scale and they, and they get um, ranked as, as um, a, a long a continuum. And these were all the people who we, we cut it at moderate suicidal risk. So, the interesting thing here, important thing here to me is that it's um, uh, a higher score on the ISME is uh, predictive, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally, and independent of the association between depression or anxiety and suicidality. So then, being an adherence researcher at heart, I felt like I had to look at whether internalized stigma was associated with medication adherence to. And medication adherence to, uh, medication adherence here just means that if you had to take all of your pills for diabetes or hypertension, uh, hypertension or cholesterol lowering medication, um, in order to be classified as adherent. So it's anything less than 100. And here we did have some participants who worked on any oral medication, so they were excluded from the analysis. And um, it, uh, it is associated. So again, this is very preliminary and we haven't looked at this in a uh, multivariate analysis yet, but... Um, Basically, when people are feeling pretty crappy about themselves and isolated, um, they um, they don't they are less likely to take their meds. Also, more likely to think about killing themselves and, and more depressed and anxious. So, um, it's uh, it's an important um, important thing to consider in all populations. And it looks like we have a Q and A question in here. Should I? Should we wait for this to the end, or how we'll should we? That. Okay. I don't know how I get this thing to disappear. Okay, maybe I will do it. Okay, so well, here it doesn't get in the way. But so, uh, in conclusion, for this very brief overview of what we found so far in internalized mental illness stigma. We see it's associated with psychological distress, associated with suicidal ideation while controlling for depression and anxiety. Uh, it reduces adherence to pill-taking regimens in people with diabetes, hypertension, and, and high cholesterol. Um, I think it's crucial that any counseling that is done with people who are, uh, who are coming in um, uh, for depression and who have other things going on in their lives, even if they are not on antidepressants, um, that uh, this gets targeted. And these, if you look at the variables in these scales, there are very specific cognitive variables that lend themselves well to behavioral therapy. Um, and, um, and then the, the final point is um, I have no data on this whatsoever, but if people with depression um, and diabetes or hypertension are, um, are feeling badly about themselves, where are they getting that from? What, what is their context? I think it would be absolutely crucial uh, to uh, plan research that looks at this stigma in their family members, because that is their context. And we know very little about that. Um, so that um, would be my suggestion for anybody who's going to be doing work in this area. So um, let's uh, switch tracks a little bit and um, talk about HIV stigma. So as I mentioned, we've been doing work in India in HIV stigma since about 2002. 
uh, we started off <clears throat> by doing some formative work, qualitative and quantitative, and developing a theoretical framework. Um, we then moved on to um, a uh, second, uh, we did that with uh, those were two borrow ones and uh, a supplement from um, the Office of AIDS Research. And then we moved on and uh, started looking at what's the association between HIV stigma and, and uh, mental and physical health in people with HIV. Um, also in the same grant, uh, looking at HIV stigma and discrimination in the, in the general public, the uninfected public. And then finally among healthcare providers, and as a very quick sidebar, we had also proposed to, um, to study this in family members, but this was back in the early 2000s. And can somebody please remind me what the white powder was that was sent in envelopes? Anthrax. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that was happening at the time. And NIAID was supposed to be funding 75% of this grant. Congress just took away millions of dollars from their funding to go into anthrax vaccine research. And we lost our funding from NIAID. And NIMH jumped in and replaced some of it, but not all of it. So we ended up with between two thirds and three quarters of the original funding. And I said, you know what? We can study four populations and do it well. So if we had to drop somebody, we ended up dropping family members. Uh, we thought that would be the most labor intensive to reach out to them and, and get them to come in. So blame Congress for me not having data on that. Added to all the things you already blame the Congress for. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so that was the Samanata study. Then, based on what we found, the drivers and, and the uh, and this high stigma prevalence, we said we need to develop interventions, enough of this descriptive stuff. So we had a wonderful medical student, um, Shilpa Shah, who was at UCSF and wanting to do a rota research rotation over in India. So we sent her over and she did a wonderful pilot study with uh, nursing students. And then we built on that and developed our cluster randomized control trial, Tristy, uh, working with um, healthcare providers in both North and South India, or primarily uh, South India. And I'll go into all of this in much more detail. Um, I think we already kind of said this. This is why. I got interested in stigma and HIV. I got tired of just reading about it in the discussion section of every paper, um, that it gets in the way of getting tested, gets in the way of taking your meds, and um, gets, um, gets in the way of, um, of uh, staying, um, of, of engaging in treatment and on taking your meds and staying in, in remaining in treatment and ultimately viral suppression. So uh, we thought it was time to put um, stigma in the method section instead. So this was the first paper we came up with, with Wayne Stewart, who is, this tells my age, he was my postdoc and now he's a full professor at GCSF. Uh, and Greg Herrick, who did some amazing work on stigma uh, in uh, LGBT populations um, and early HIV before it was even really a hot topic. Uh, my wonderful colleague, um, who sadly uh, died a few years ago, Jayashree Ramakrishna, named Hans Shalini Bharat, who was a faculty member at SIS in Mumbai and now is the director of the institution. Um, Sarah Chandi, who was my long-term collaborator at St. John's, uh, now has moved on to Kerala, Judith Rubel at um, UCSF and me. So um, we started off with some qualitative uh, work with 16 uh, people with HIV, just to find out what the, what the themes were, what, what were their experiences before we went ahead and put together any scales. We, um, these were the things they told us about. They reported 
mistreatment in healthcare settings, that they wouldn't get as good treatment as other people, sometimes outright refusal of care, and uh, no confidentiality. So all familiar stories from early days here before any of us start feeling superior. Um, they were also discriminated against by their families. They were told not to share food. They might have their special utensils they have to keep in a different cabinet. They couldn't care for children in the family. And remember, a lot of people were living in, uh, or the joint families still are. So there may be multiple generations and, and children and in-laws and, and so on. Um, they felt that they were being blamed for, for being infected. Uh, they reported rejection uh, by pretty much everybody that they told. And there were lots of stories, even in people who hadn't disclosed, of having heard that somebody else was stigmatized. They may have heard stories, they may have seen it on TV, they may have read it in the papers, which made them very, um, uh, very cautious. So these were some of the common stigma avoidant coping strategies that they reported to us. Uh, lots of people, interestingly enough, said that they had TB, which used to be a stigmatized disease, but when HIV came along, not so much, because it turns out everything's relative. So um, the problem was that TB treatment was typically nine months, so what do you do after that? Um, some people just took kind of a don't ask, don't tell. So they would just try to avoid talking about it and hoping nobody was going to ask them. Uh, some people did report lying outright. Uh, lots of people told us that they wouldn't go to hospitals that were near their homes or to pharmacies near their homes. Again, because of lack of confidentiality, they were afraid that somebody's brother's you know, something in law would be working there and all of a sudden it would be all over the family. And since literacy was limited uh, in many families, they just didn't translate any of the written documents or prescriptions that they brought home. Um, so then we, we put some of these things they reported to us into scales and piloted them in my uh, adherence cohort. And I think the main take home here is that, and this was very early, remember this was in the, uh, probably about 2004 or so, 2005 maybe. Um, not many people had experienced stigma themselves. But most people, pretty much everybody, had heard of it happening to someone else. So that's the vicarious uh, column. So a lot of what was driving their behavior was what they had heard from, from others. Um, we, uh, they also told us that um, uh, because, because they didn't have any privacy at home, they didn't want to take their medication in front of others. They would hide their pills, hide their pill taking, and then of course they would miss doses. There was one woman who came in and who had taken 50% of, of her medication. And, and we said, you know, this really is not enough, unfortunately, with these medications. You, you need to take, she only had to take those twice a day. And she said, I'm the daughter-in-law in the family. You know, everything's my fault, I have no power. Um, I just can't let anybody know that I'm infected and there's no privacy. So what I do is I have about half an hour of privacy every day, every evening when I bathe my children. I take them into the bathroom and then I smuggle in a pill and I swallow it with a back water. That's the one pill she took each day. That's the one she felt was safe. Where did my screen go? My screen disappeared here. I have no screen. I, I can look like this, but I have no screen in front of me. Um, so um, anyway, based on based on this, uh, we put together this this um, framework. How did you get it back? I just tapped it. Oh. 
Okay, and we need to go back. I don't know how to make that go. The audience can't, the virtual audience can't see it. Uh, okay, I'll re I, can, I know what, what it says there. So the other thing I don't have here is, um, I think we just need to ignore it. But how do I, I can't get back here now. No, other way, other way, there we go. Okay, so it says mental health consequences of HIV stigma here at Framework. So basically what we found out was that enacted stigma wasn't that common, but when it happened, it had a, it, you, it didn't take much, it only took once. It had a profound effect on psychological distress. More commonly was that these, these other pathways that you heard, you heard of stigma happening to others, that gave you the impression that it's really not a very friendly world out there to people with HIV. Um, you likely would feel badly about yourself. Both of those things impacted whether or not you would tell others about your infection. And that if, if you don't tell anybody, you also can't get any social support, right? So, that just leads to more psychological distress. And of course, internalized stigma also has a direct pathway to psychological distress. Um, so the Samanata study, which is really all that's being blocked here, um, we, uh, we, it was a cross-sectional study in Bangalore and Mumbai, and we interviewed 961 people with HIV, over a thousand healthcare workers, which was split between physicians, nurses, and ward staff, and over a thousand members of the uninfected kind of general public. We found them in various outpatient settings, uh, and they were bored sitting waiting to be seen. Uh, but these, they were, they were sampled across multiple uh, outpatient settings that were unrelated to HIV. If they had HIV, they, they didn't tell us. And it was still, the prevalence wasn't that high and, and they weren't in any uh, at-risk group. So we think that was that was fairly low. So these are these are the three papers that I will try to summarize quickly. I just realized that there's no clock in here. I have no idea how to think. Yeah, you have about 15 minutes. That's it? Yeah. Fifteen. Yes, Whoa. Yeah, we started late too. So okay. Um, so we had multiple measures of of stigma. All the ones that I've been talking about. I'm not going to cover that. This was the general population, and all I need to say here is that there was really no problem getting people to admit to um, having stigma attitudes or intending to um, treat people with HIV differently from others. They, they were not shy about that. So very high attitude, very high stigma attitudes um, and lots of blame seen here. And um, in fact, the things that were driving the, the Endorsement of these coercive policies were things like people with HIV should be quarantined, they shouldn't be allowed to have children, shouldn't be allowed to get married. Very punitive uh, strategies. And um, there was high endorsement on that. And also the <coughs> intent to treat people with HIV differently. Uh, if you had negative feelings towards people with HIV, if you blame them, if you had misconceptions about how HIV was transmitted, um, and uh, if you felt that your treatment, your feelings towards people with HIV affected your attitudes, you were much more likely to report stigma and intend to discriminate. Um, then we went on and thought, well, surely things are going to be a lot better uh, among healthcare workers, right? Because they are educated. Yeah, no, not so much. So very similar numbers there. Um, the uh, uh, a, a little 
No, not, 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 you can't even really say that doctors did any better than anybody else. I think the only place where they did was that they may have been less likely to play. Uh, but maybe then again, they knew that they weren't supposed to say that, I don't know. But that was really scary to us, that all of these things that the people with HIV had told us that they thought healthcare providers felt, they were right, they did. Um, so basically, 89% of the doctors, 88% of the nurses, 73% of the ward staff said that they would treat people with HIV differently from other patients in situations that involve potential fluid exposure. The numbers were slightly less in situations that didn't involve fluid exposure. So this would be things like taking blood pressure or giving someone a pill. Um, so, and similar correlates for, uh, for this population. Uh, the only um, positive thing here is that having more frequent professional contact with people living with HIV uh, was negatively correlated with stigma. So that showed us that maybe with experience, there is some hope. Maybe with exposure, there is some hope. Otherwise, all the, all the same correlates. And um, so high levels of stigma attitudes. The majority said they would either refuse or treat people with HIV differently or would take unnecessary precautions like double gloving. And the driving factors seem to be fear of infection, um, symbolic stigma, negative attitudes, and blame. So those were the things we thought we're gonna need to, uh, we're gonna need to target. So, um, we wanted to develop this intervention that we call DRISTI. Uh, and the challenges we had uh, when we were thinking about how to do this was, we had heard about this wonderful intervention that uh, ICRW had put together, the uh, Center for Research on, International Center for Research on Women. Three day seminar involves everybody in the hospital for an entire three days. Lots of in-person, lots of opportunities to reflect, lots of skills training, and what's the problem? <laughs> so those kinds of workshops are really time consuming and they can be a logistical nightmare to put together. Healthcare providers are busy. There's no way hospital superintendents are gonna let everybody take three days off. It's not scalable. So, we needed to come up with something that was individual, flexible, and tailored to the particular drivers needed. So that's what we did. We based it on the toolkit by ICRW, ICRW, but we went through that with our drivers in mind and picked out the activities that we thought were targeting those the most clearly. And we made this really interactive uh, two session um, program app, really, uh, Android app that could be delivered on a tablet. We could pull people out when they, when they had some time off, they put on headphones, they could be in the corner anywhere where, you know, where they just had a little bit of space and they got to interact um, with, with the app. And then being a behavioral scientist, I couldn't totally let go of, of the, in-person part, so we did have one skills training group session, which was co-facilitated by a person with HIV, where people got to practice these things that they had learned and got corrected feedback. And they also made commitments, pledges. Um, this is India, this is where we were. We were primarily in the South, a little bit in Delhi. Um, and again, the outcomes were the same two variables, intent to discriminate in, in professional situations. We didn't really care about if they wanted people with HIV as their neighbors, that wasn't our focus. It was situations in the hospital that they were likely to be in. And we really wanted to decrease the blame and, and for them to endorse these crazy punitive measures. And we measured this at baseline post-intervention six and five month follow-up. Um, we had the two modules, these were the topics, defining stigma. We, um, 
did this virtual walkthrough, which I'll show you in a second, which I think is, is really cool, uh, probably the coolest thing we did. We um, covered beliefs and attitudes, and we had videos by people with HIV of their personal stories or a mix of various personal stories that they told to try to give, put faces to, to these stories. Um, and as, as a kind of side, side point is, we found that even acting in these videos was stigmatizing. We had a really hard time finding people, including staff in the hospital who were willing to act in these videos. My staff ended up volunteering for most of it, uh, earning their Oscars <laughs> along the way, uh, because their families told them, oh, you can't be in a video about stage HIV. What would people think? So, uh, this is what the interface looks like for the virtual walkthrough. Everybody here probably has done Google Street View. That's kind of what it is. We walked around with a camera in the hospital, literally, and, and filmed it. And you can follow it on the tablet. And when you get to these different uh, settings, which were all settings where that people had told us they had experienced stigma, you could click on it and up popped a little video um, showing an interaction that was stigmatizing and, um, and then somebody else jumping in and, and giving corrective feedback. And I think in the interest of time, sadly, we're not gonna be able to show you those, but I can, I can share the YouTube. We have this uploaded on the private YouTube channel. I can share the link. You can go through them to your heart's content. Some of the music that it's set to is going to remind you of Jaws. For, my, for, <laughs> for some reason, they, they were not targeting middle-aged white women from San Francisco. So I'm trying to be very non-judgmental because this is what the people we piloted it on wanted. So just, just a warning. So these were just screenshots of, uh, of the videos uh, that we did. And we had this nurse here who was kind of the MC through the whole thing. And there's the YouTube. Um, then for, for the uh, second uh, module, we went through the misconceptions, went through their fears and behaviors, and very importantly, went through standard precautions, universal precautions, because you have to take their fear seriously. We want them to start treating people with HIV the same as everybody else, but we also don't want them to be fearful because there really is no reason to. So we spent a lot of time on standard precautions. And then we had the skills training group that I already told you about. So these, these are the, this is the summary of the results. So among the nursing students, there is significantly improved transmission knowledge, reduced misconceptions regarding casual contact, reduced their worry about infection, and reduced the, the stigma variables um, that, that we are outcome variables. Uh, for the ward staff, um, it, um, it didn't improve transmission knowledge, but it uh, changed all of these other four variables in the, in the right direction. This was at the six month follow-up. And that's, that's the article, which is now open source, if anybody wants to read it, get the exact results. And I'm not going to dwell on them, because then this is the last point I want to make. Uh, and that's that we, we were interested after we had seen this. We were thrilled that, um, uh, that the uh, intervention had a significant uh, effect on the outcome variables. But we weren't really sure why. Did it have anything to do with the drivers that we were targeting? So my uh, MPI, Dr. Sh uh, Srinivasan in, in Bangalore, did this analysis uh, at 12 months, looking at changes in the drivers post-intervention and if they mediated uh, the, uh, the outcomes. And they did. They, they didn't fully mediate, but they partially mediated. So in particular, both blame, changes in, in blame and symbolic stigma and transition, transmission misconceptions, uh, changes in the directions we want, um, decrease, uh, were associated with a decrease in the uh, stigma attitudes. Um, 
and the intervention also had a direct effect. So this was the endorsement of coercive measures um, and looking at intent to discriminate in both high and low risk situations, uh, similar results. Uh, and as you see there, the instrumental stigma, which is fear of becoming infected in your professional setting, that's why it's so important to teach standard precautions and, and really teach them to trust them uh, because doing so is going to make them much more likely to treat uh, people with HIV the same as, as everybody else. Um, also helping them gain more empathy, which is really what a lot of what the symbolic stigma is about, um, and uh, uh, reducing their misconceptions about casual transmission. Uh, also partially mediated um, uh, the, the changes in outcomes. And then again, the intervention had some direct effect on that. So, um, so where do we go from here? So back when we started this study, people didn't really have smartphones much in, in, in India, or at least not the populations we wanted to work with. Now they do, and nobody uses tablets. So we need to adapt this for smartphones. We also need to adapt it for people's very short attention span when they're on their smartphones. <laughs> so we may need to shorten it even more and have more modules. Uh, we may want to evaluate whether the app alone is as efficacious as doing that inpatient session that I was so attached to. We need to see really does did that make a difference. Um, I think we need to start working on more innovative outcome measures. We would really love, ideally, to go out in um, clinics and, and wards and watch people, but it's kind of hard to be unobtrusive doing that. It's also hard to catch situations where they are around someone with HIV. Um, we are trying, we're flirting with whether or not we could do this a kind of virtual reality situation and observe people in that and really put them in a situation where they felt they were there. Um, and then other thoughts or questions. So what I thought is, is uh, standardized patients. We've used uh, standardized patient actors in Kenya in a few studies to see how people with STI symptoms are treated in pharmacies. And it seems you could, you know, you could have a few different actors who go in and say they have HIV and are seeing someone looking for, you know, they move to the area, they need, need medications or something, and you could have them write everything down and even have a hidden recorder. Mm -hmm. So how would you do that on a ward though? Because that was what a lot of where a lot of yeah, this... I mean, you, yeah, to have somebody be actually admitted would be hard. It would be easier on outpatients. Yeah. Guess. And and like this ward staff we were working with, we we got the reports about the stigma that was happening on the wards. I I was thinking somebody about somebody needs to like work with you to like uh, fake uh, transfer from another facility and have your fake doctor sign off on that. <laughs> and hopefully your IRB will allow that. <laughs> yeah, I think if you just, yeah. you could try it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think it's it's creative. Um, I, I, I'd love to brainstorm about these yeah, things yeah. because we do it. <laughs> absolutely. Um, any other thoughts or questions? And I mean, no, I went through this very quickly. So anybody who wants to watch any of these slides later, send me questions, whatever, I'm, I'm available. Uh, but um, any other thoughts? There is one question in the Q&A box. If you, oh, if you uh, and, okay, let's see how it goes. It's a good question. How do we know internalized stigma is mainly emanating from mental illness associated stigma alone? Well, in these particular questions, that was what we asked about. Those were the questions. I'm, I don't want to go to social settings because, I'm, because I have emotional problems. I'm not acting like everybody else and it will bring shame on my family. So these particular questions were all phrased around mental illness. But, but yes, it's entirely possible that if they had some other undesirable characteristic that that might be an added reason why they um, 
why they wouldn't want to be social or, or felt isolated. Um, but um, when you when you read these questions, they're really heartbreaking. Um, uh, you know, you, you get so sad when you see that people are endorsing them, and, and that this really represents how they're feeling that that they are worth less and they bring shame on others and they are not going to have good lives because of their mental illness. Um, that's an excellent question and a lot of them didn't. They weren't aware of it. They, we had, I remember one situation where... Yeah, they can't see the question, see my question. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I, oh, they, they can't see, see it. Can see oh, it. sorry. Did the health providers recognize their own attitudes and behaviors as stigmatizing is the question. Um, sorry about that. I didn't realize the Zoom audience didn't see that. Um, so it's an excellent question. It, in the early days of this, we brought someone in from the positive network to meet with, uh, with us and, and the doctors who were involved in creating the study. And one of them said, you know, when I, when I go, when I sit in the clinic, the doctor comes in and examines me, touches me, and then goes straight to the sink to wash their hands before they go out. They really make me feel dirty. And, and the doctors were horrified to hear this because to them, they were just practicing good infection control. So we were brainstorming and, we, we, and what they came up with was, well, how about if we do both? When I come into the room, before I touch you, I will go to the sink and I will wash my hands so that I won't transfer my germs to you. And then afterwards, I will do the same so I won't transfer my germs to the next person I see. And to, to this patient who, who came in, who was talking to them about this, that really gave a totally different message. And it was so simple. And this was definitely a situation where the healthcare provider was horrified to find out that they'd been doing something that felt stigmatizing to their patients they didn't mean to. Um, so in an online session, do you think the stigma-driven behaviors on part of providers will be lower? The risk is non-issue in online care, but stigma-affecting behavior will still impact behavior. So do you mean, um, does that mean when you are doing like telemedicine or what an online session? Am, am I being dense? Is, is that like when you're practicing digital health? Oh, yes, telemedicine, yes. Um, I would imagine that there would be some stigmatizing behaviors that will be harder to do telemedicine-wise, especially in terms of stuff like the hand washing or, or the touching that we hear about, that people won't touch me. Um, there may be other things that people do that we just don't really know about. I think that's an excellent research question uh, to find out how would stigma manifest itself during interactions in telemedicine versus in in-person clinic visits. Good question. More research. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Mogaga, I'm a global health student here. So I have a question about, uh, I mean, what, what, uh, what has caught my attention is the responses from the healthcare providers themselves and uh, how that compares, you know, to the others. So I'm, I'm wondering whether they picked these from their training. So, I mean, is there a role to look at the training, medical training, and the facts that are given about HIV, yeah. how those facts influence? I mean, maybe that's, inter inter that's where the intervention should be. And lastly, whether you think uh, the amount of funding that's, that goes to HIV compared to other 
diseases is a manifestation of these. Hmm. I, I don't I don't know about the last question. Pamela would actually know that one better than me. <laughs> but um, but the first one, absolutely. I, I think this does need to be integrated into the curriculum. And given that we were working with nursing students, uh, some of my Indian collaborators are trying to work with uh, nursing schools to incorporate some of this into the nursing school curriculum, because that, that is where it needs to sit um, before people start going out on the wards. And it shouldn't have to be separate research projects. We just needed to do this to show that it can work. But now, absolutely, you. That should be the next step. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, great presentation. I can read too much of this. Uh, my name is Kasmir. So my concern is uh, you talked about uh, reduction or reduced stigma from providers after the training. So I'm wondering what were the measures that you used to uh, kind of determine the uh, decrease in stigma uh, from providers yeah. Well, how did okay. I know I kind of sort of skipped over that scale because it was the same measures that we had used earlier to look at their endorsement of the coercive measures, for example. So the questions about, you know, should people with HIV be quarantined? Should they be allowed to have the same human rights as everybody else? Although we asked about specific rights. Um, and if when, when, you, when you see a patient with HIV, um, you know, in, in, and we had like five different situations, I think, for nurses and five for ward staff. We had the common situations that they experienced, some of which involved um, risk for fluid exchange, like cleaning an open wound or starting an IV uh, versus um, uh, taking their blood pressure or just giving them a pill. Um, and for each of them, they had lots of options for, what, for how they would treat uh, the patient. And anything that else than saying they would just treat them like everybody else was considered uh, stigmatizing. So that would be either I would refuse to care for them, to do this procedure with them, or I would you know, delegate it to someone else, or I, I would only touch them if I could have double gloves. Those, those were three options. And you would be surprised. There really didn't seem to be much social desirability going on here because people were freely admitting to this because they just, as somebody pointed out earlier, may not even have been aware that that was going to perceive, be perceived as uh, stigmatizing. It may be good also to point out that even though Maria has done all of her, a lot of her work in, in India, um, this kinds of stigma exists in healthcare providers here in the U.S. as well. Um, I have a patient who I just sent to a small hospital in central Washington for an x-ray study, and, and he told me all about his experience of stigma there. Um, so it does happen. It's yeah, and actually, that's why my question is, because most often when you ask providers about how they relate, there's some who outrightly will tell you, like, okay, this is how we handle the uh, client. And some would say, oh no, this is what they are supposed to, like this is how we should treat them. Especially given that you had questions and you were asking them on what you think this situation would look like. I'm trying to think that they might respond on, given that you are trained, you know, they respond to what they want us to hear. So I'm wondering, did you have maybe questions before that? We, or did we did look at the institutional policies too. Um, as far as I recall, no, no curriculum, no training program told them to use double gloves, for example. And yet, most, most of the people who endorsed that, which was the most common unnecessary precaution, did so because they, they figured when we talked to them that if one glove is good, two gloves are better. So that, that was not necessarily how they'd been trained. They were certainly not told that they could refuse care. And yet many of them freely said that, no, I really wouldn't want to do that. I'd ask someone else to do it. So, uh, so some of it may have, may have been, well, everybody else is doing it, so it's probably okay. 
but it doesn't seem like it was part of the training. And there were multiple bizarre things that were part of the training, like they were fumigating labor rooms after they'd been used by somebody, you know, with uh, with HIV. So, um, which we know is not necessary. But uh, but those particular that was not part of you know one of our questions. Thank you. My last question, though. Okay, so we have two questions that. up there. <laughs> so, All right. Is it a short one? Yeah, so did you maybe talk to patients after to understand their perception? Like, how did they feel? How were they treated? Did we talked to patients throughout. I mean, they were part of designing the study and the instruments, and they came and, and uh, they took part in, the, they, they did videos for us of their stories. And they uh, co-facilitated, or people with HIV, I shouldn't call them patients, um, people with HIV who had certainly been in the patient role many times, uh, they co-facilitated the, the skills training group. So they were, they were in there. can do an email follow-up. In some of the questions I have, I can email, uh, I can do an email to you. Thank you. Okay, so indicators that's a that's a really that's a really good question what is the gold standard in terms of measuring sleep uh, you know preferably observation that that you actually see that it happens but there are so many stories from patients themselves which was those 961 people that we interviewed who told us about the stigma that's happening to them that was then echoed both by the general population and by the healthcare providers. Um, so I think we're fairly certain that there were high levels of stigma um, and discrimination occurring in these uh, settings. Um, but yeah, if I, if I could dream up a gold standard, I would say observing it is, is probably it. Um, I have not really seen research doing that to determine level of stigma. And if I have missed something, you know, someone please speak up and correct me. But but I think that's something that a lot of us are are struggling with. I mean, there are there are measures like uh, implicit biases that people are looking at, and and I know that around uh, racial stigmas, there are people doing virtual reality. Um, uh, assessments, and this is happening at, at UCSF right now, uh, not my group, but that's what kind of triggered me to start thinking about maybe this would work for HIV stigma as well. Uh, I think you could, and, and as you mentioned, the standardized patients, um, but, but, but in terms of indicators to measure the level of stigma in any setting, I'm you know, that it's still fairly individual levels. It was just maybe a biomarker, such as uh, something in neuroimaging or some sort hmm. of... Uh, um, that I'm not aware of. Good study of that. Or, you know, we could measure stress corticosal to, you know, yeah. see if people were... But, but yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. We, we don't typically like self-report. One of the things we worry about is social desirability bias. I can be fairly confident in saying that that's not what they were trying to do. They were not trying to say something they thought we wanted to hear because uh, we were kind of horrified seeing what they told us. Um, oh, the next one is a really long question. Um, it's, uh, and mine has died here again, so I'm going to read it off here. Just tap your screen. Maria, this um, can be your last question. Right, it's a little over time. Yes, yes, I know. Could you briefly talk about, it is the last question, could you briefly talk about your conceptual theoretical model of stigma and comment on how your work speaks to ongoing research around intersectional stigma? Um, so I'd be happy to make our paper on the conceptual model um, available to everybody because I we're past time and, and it would, to do a good job would probably um, take longer than we have. Um, the second part's really interesting, uh, and it's not really something I have thought a lot about how our model would, um, would speak to that. 
Um, there are so many different ways that people are looking at intersectional stigma these days. Um, some people are studying, and again, I refer you to Seth Kelligman and Janet Turan's work, among others, but some people are looking at stigma to various conditions separately. Some are measuring just stigma in, in general that you are feeling and then trying to tease things apart. Some people are looking additively at it. Uh, there really are no gold standards right now. And I suppose you could take some of these questions and repeat them for the other stigmatized conditions that your participants have, although they kind of already were ready to kill us because we had like a 50 page questionnaire. And if you triple that with the three different conditions, um, it, it, will be, it will be a high response burden for the participants. Not that I'm not taking your question seriously, but I, I think it's something that many people are struggling with and thinking about right now. And um, I really would encourage you to read those papers, write to me. I'd be happy to have conversations and Zoom calls about it because it is it's an area that, that we have to address. Thank you. Finally, to cut it off, but thank you very much, Maria. Really appreciate you coming out here, and thank you all for attending on behalf of CFAR.